Goichi Suda, also known as Suda51, is a video game designer who works at the Grasshopper Manufacture Studio. Whether he's in the role of writer, designer, or straight up director on a project at the company, any entry in his body of work usually gets inducted into the quote unquote Suda51 brand. Capitalizing on his notoriety, which went up considerably during the mid 2000s with the release of cult hits like Killer7 and No More Heroes. His name has been used to sell games he's involved with, and even if he isn't credited as the director, he features heavily in the marketing and interviews surrounding pre-release hype. At the start of his rise, I was a pretty big fan of his and Grasshopper's work, but as time has gone on, I've really grown detached from his output and find myself disappointed by a lot of the company's releases. Furthermore, there are lots of other niche creators these days who are taking center stage over what used to be one of gaming's more prominent auteur studios, and I want to go into why that may be, since I felt like Grasshopper and the Suda51 name had a lot of potential that was never fully realized. Grasshopper and Suda's first few games made at the turn of the millennium were Japanese exclusive story-focused adventure titles with simple stylish presentations to offset the resource constraints they faced at the time. Detective titles starring smooth operators and eccentric characters involved in a complex web of conspiracies and devious plots. A bunch of cool, edgy, exotic niche Japanese games out of reach for us Westerners, slowly giving the company some exposure. But they still didn't really have much presence outside of their native country. That was until Capcom decided to publish their biggest and most ambitious adventure game yet worldwide, Killer7. <laughs> Killer7 to me still marks the highest point in the company's history as their most creative and inspired work on both a story and gameplay level. Killer7 has you controlling an assassin capable of transforming into a series of seven different personalities, all of which come with their own abilities and character. They fight to kill weird zombie suicide bombers in a politically tumultuous time where distrust between nations is rising again after world peace is achieved with the destruction of all nukes. Okay then. The gameplay is a merger of adventure game, puzzle solver, rail shooter, first person shooter, and even a bit of horror game in there too, as you explore levels and fight invisible enemies, switching back and forth between each personality to access new areas. It won't be for everyone, but there's no denying that Killer7 is an absolutely unique and uncompromising experience with its striking visuals, unnerving sound effects, and confident mix of mechanics. It's inspired both mechanically and thematically. After this game, Grasshopper released a couple of licensed anime titles. None of these were released in Europe, so I never got the chance to play them, and they received much less of a push than what would be afforded to Grasshopper's next big original game. <laughs> No More Heroes. Like Killer7, No More Heroes is another game that feels inspired in terms of plot and gameplay. You play as a nerdy Japanese pop culture obsessed assassin who takes part in a series of ranked fights against other killers to become number one. I just want to be number one and to plow down on the beautiful organizer of it all. If I become number one, will you do it with me? The merge of mechanics is a little less tight than in Killer7. This time we have chop em up lightsaber gameplay stages found throughout an open world city interspersed with part-time job minigames. Once again, not a perfect or complex game, but one that took chances and resulted in an experience you can't really get anywhere else. Killer7 and No More Heroes felt like the first two titles in a sort of anthology. Games with similar themes that sported dark, subversive subject matter, but ones that blended radically different gameplay. Unfortunately, after these two games, things started to slowly fall apart for me. No More Heroes was the most popular game in the company's history up to that point, from what I can tell, prompting a sequel to be made. And while No More Heroes 2 Desperate Struggle contained a lot of the heart and character of the original, it also felt a lot more phoned in. No More Heroes was still a subversive, dark, gritty title like Killer7, but kind of became known as this super crazy game with loads of wacky characters and moments thanks to some of the comedy it introduced. Yeah, what is it, Mr. Cosplay? And the second title seemed to lean into these elements way more than the original did. What was once an eccentric yet fairly grounded world in the first became a super wacky cartoon of a place in the follow-up, turning it into more of a parody than a title that deconstructed action games a bit. Sometimes it just wanted to celebrate the previous title's success and bask in its memes, and other times it wanted to develop the characters by re-examining the series' premise, and I just don't know if those two things really coalesced all that well here. Not only that, but the open world from the original, which garnered a fair bit of criticism from critics for its sparseness, 
was removed entirely, with missions now just being picked out from a menu. What was once a pretty out there gameplay loop for an action game, earning money and living out a life in between missions, had become way more standard and conventional, and the lack of depth was now shining through, where it was masked a lot more in No More Heroes 1. The next big grasshopper project, Shadows of the Damned, was pretty underwhelming overall, which is a shame because it was another collaboration between Goichi Suda and legendary game director Shinji Mikami, creator of Resident Evil and God Hand. In this game, you play as Demon Hunter Garcia and are tasked with going into hell to rescue your girlfriend with your talking skull gun. Yeah, this time I can sum it up uh, pretty quickly. It's a third-person shooter in the vein of Resident Evil 4, but further comparisons to that game probably aren't going to be very favorable. The title isn't terrible, but it's kind of an ungraceful and tedious corridor shooter where you wait for enemies to reveal a big glowing weak point and then shoot into it. The game performs technically pretty badly too, and variety in the gameplay is a pretty mixed affair. Shoot enemies or shoot them in an area where your health is being depleted. Defend this location, do a throwback shmup segment that moves along at a snail pace. Suda combat was never especially deep, but usually there was at least some kind of twist to distract you from that and keep things interesting. But not really here. It's just a third-person shooter. I don't know if this kind of slow, clunky third-person shooter combat really fit the thrill ride through hell vibe the game was going for. Hey, at least it wasn't a cover shooter. Thematically, most of the game is focused on juvenile crass humor. Sure, Travis made jokes, and No More Heroes was a funny game, but part of the reason Travis's weapon recharge was so suggestive, for example, is that he was a big dork. Older Suda games were way more reserved. Shadows of the Damned seems like it's trying to show off how audacious it is way too hard at almost every turn. The honeys there used to give the most lovely boo jobs before I fucked them in their own sockets. Whoa, look at me. Look, I'm not a prude. I'm down for some shocking comedy. But when a game is trying this hard and I'm just kind of yawning and bored throughout instead of being surprised, then something's got to be missing. It's just like a lot of disparate stuff coming out here, an adults-only fairground ride that feels like one because of how janky the spectacle is, and that's hard to connect with. Every level feels like a cardboard cutout floating in space somewhere rather than any real sort of place. None of the comedy here manages to distract from the fact that unpolished Resident Evil 4 in Hell just doesn't seem all that impressive compared to previous works at the company. It's with their next big title, Lollipop Chainsaw, though, where I feel they really burnt their bridges with me. Both in terms of premise and gameplay, Chainsaw just feels completely unoriginal. You play as a cheerleader who, with her big chainsaw, has to stop a horde of zombies infesting her town. Basically, it's a zombie pastiche, which has been done to death loads of times already. The dark comedy where zombies invade small-town America. Derivative is all hell compared to what we were getting earlier on. Add to that completely forgettable slasher gameplay. Dial in some dial combos, buy some new ones, wait for your limited time super powered up mode to become active so you can turn invincible, etc. Even if it wasn't boring, the combat would still be nothing new. No More Heroes isn't some endless well of depth, but I can't think of many other games that play with its same sense of tempo and flow and style. This is just bleh. Lollipop Chainsaw is trying so hard at every turn to shock you with its outrageous bosses and premise, but it never comes close to eliciting any of the surprise I got from the first few Grasshopper titles. And of course, any of the charming sophistication of those games is also gone. That's why the next Suda51 branded title, Killer is Dead, is a bit of a guilty pleasure for me. Sure, it's about as standard as Hack and Slash has come, but this visually striking, smooth talker starring action title comes with a bit more of that noir spark that was present in earlier Grasshopper projects. It may not be getting all that creative gameplay-wise like Killer7, but the mood and style of this one was enough to get my attention. It's a shame the story was convoluted, but lacked any interesting hook gameplay-wise or character-wise to keep you invested throughout like Killer7 did. The characters feel a bit distant and one note compared to people in past Grasshopper titles. Killer is Dead has a lot of cryptic symbolism going on and weird abstract flashbacks, but if it was trying to say something at this stage in the company's history, hardly anybody cared to figure it out. Grasshopper and Suda had solidified themselves so much with their last few titles as the wacky action game people that hardly anybody was left around who would be interested in deconstructing Killer is Dead and seeing if there was any depth to it, seeing if there was any meaningfulness to the story. Story. Instead, most coverage was focused on those scandalous gigolo missions about hitting on the babes. Unfortunately, it felt like most people were only interested in talking about that stuff. Perhaps a little bit of a byproduct of the new outrageous image Grasshopper seemed like they wanted to have at the time. 
I think those past few games bit them in the ass a bit because Killer is Dead probably had a little more going on, but I just think that at this point, people assumed it didn't. And while I kind of got a chuckle out of them, I don't think Gigolo Mode probably helped in that regard. After this, the next heavy hitter on the horizon at the studio was going to be Lily Bergamo, which featured a cool looking chick fighting some kind of giant red monster with a bunch of bandages. After promotion started for the title, and even what appears to be a cosplayer was brought in for marketing, Lily Bergamo was rebranded to Let It Die a free-to-play game about blokes bashing each other to bits in their underpants throughout a bunch of subway tunnels. In this title, you play as a nameless mook of your choosing and then head into a giant dystopic tower to level up and make it to the top. The change in look and direction from Bergamo is striking. Apparently, while working on the original concept, Grasshopper focused in on the idea of dying and the game taking your data for use against you. Having it coded into a character that would appear in the enemy ranks and decided to craft a title that would work better in tandem with that concept. Let it die in its grind isn't really my thing. We've come from stylish, genre-bending romps like Killer7 to free-to-play Dark Souls-like combat with microtransactions. Maybe they thought personality-driven single-player action games were just not making that much money, so this change to a more role-playing style of adventure would be a good mix-up for them. And maybe it was. Turns out the game did well with over 4 million downloads. Sure, I guess free is an easier way to get there, but this is probably the pseudo grasshopper game that's been in the hands of the most people. There was even apparently a Killer7 DLC event thing that happened. Uh, I don't know, guys. I feel like decades from now, Killer7 will be a little more well-remembered than Let It Die, which feels kind of undeserving of being the big dog Killer7 runs up behind to as a runt, looking to tag along. More recently, calling back to the good old days, Suda announced Travis Strikes Again, a new No More Heroes game. People were pretty excited when this was first announced, but as the nature of the title was slowly revealed to be a sort of rinky-dink spin-off, I think there's been less enthusiasm. There's also the weird fact that at the moment it appears that longtime Travis Touchdown voice actor Robin Atkin Downs won't be playing the titular protagonist in this title, which is a real shame. I don't know, apparently there's not going to be any voiceover in the game at all. The gameplay of No More Heroes was never especially deep, and I'm going to say it, I think a lot of the why people liked these games as much as they did was down to how fun it was to be and to be around Travis Touchdown. And the big reason his antics are communicated so well is thanks to Downs' amazing performance. It's deranged, unhinged, and just cool enough to be endearing without ever going too far and making you forget you're playing as a big nerd. Hey! He's gone! Mr. Sir Henry motherfucker, he just jetted! What a pussy. It's a really unique performance, and perhaps the Japanese devs don't understand that as well as the Western fans do. You're the one leaving in a body bag. Suda has also stated that if Travis Strikes Again does well, he might be able to make No More Heroes 3, which are just terms I reject outright. I don't negotiate with video game terrorists like this. Buy the thing you don't really want as much and we might make the thing you do want a lot. People were much more up for buying this thing when they thought they were getting a No More Heroes game. I'm kinda worried Grasshopper might not get the numbers they want to to justify making another main No More Heroes game by selling a more niche title in an already niche series. I played it at a convention, and while it seems like decent, mindless fun, I wonder if that will be enough to bring fans back on board after all these years. So where am I going with all of this? Well, I see the potential the Suda51 game, quote-unquote, had, starting with those first classy little adventures with cool ideas and themes that could then reach a wider audience and the big exciting action titles to follow. But then that potential was kind of squandered as the games devolved into shallow jokester titles with not much substance beyond the surface. It seems like the moment they got wind that something like the comedy in their first super jokey game was one of the reasons people were into it, they completely steered off into that direction. Focusing on making the most faux, outrageous games possible while streamlining things gameplay-wise, taking not many risks in that department. And I feel like if they had stuck to their guns and kept making games in the same vein as Silver Case, Killer7, and No More Heroes, they could be getting Yoko Taro levels of praise now. Yoko Taro made a bunch of somewhat clumsy, yet dark and memorable games for years that, while unpolished and lacking in wide appeal, had a lot of heart and integrity by changing rules and conventions and mixing and matching genres in titles like Nier, or making impenetrable convoluted story timelines in games like Drakengard that attracted a niche audience keen to dive in and decipher everything. I honestly see a lot of pseudorisms, per se, in games like Drakengard 3. 
and after waiting it out for years, a combo of talent and Yoko Taro's auteur design finally collided in Nier Automata, a more polished action game with style and grace and all that that managed to deliver his themes and ideas to a huge array of people. And now everyone loves him. Now, to be fair, he had a giant company like Square Enix mysteriously backing his games, but you get what I mean, right? Suda's titles kept being pumped out with not much care for their lasting legacy. Nobody is really going to afford the same level of interest and analysis to a game like Lollipop Chainsaw the same way they might have done to a modern-day refined analogue to Killer7. Or the same way people now obsessively look back on the Drakengard games and how they relate to Nier. The wacky meme times took over, and as memes tend to do, their lasting appeal dies out after a while. I mean, look at the bosses for Travis Strikes Again. Nice looking, but there's a huge element of overkill to these designs. Remember when a No More Heroes villain could just be a dude in a suit and he was fun to watch and memorable because of the way he acted and the things he said, before they just became concept art to fight with barely a word spoken. I'm no longer surprised by what these games try to throw at me because it never amounts to much, and while I'm very open to Travis Strikes Again being a fun little action title to kill some time with, I highly doubt it will be able to pack in the themes and heart of that first game. Travis takes a shit to save, okay, but he's just doing it in the middle of the street now? How random. Luckily for everyone, this is the part I get to exonerate Suda and the team to an extent, which is great because, you know, I love Suda51. I think he's great. Just seems like a guy who wants to make some badass games. I'm down with that. In an art book released in 2015, Suda spilt the beans on what went down with the development of some of these games. Supposedly, the publisher EA pretty much made Suda scrap his original ideas for Shadows of the Damned, forcing him to write five drafts before giving him a go ahead. They went as far as to tell him that if you can't sum up the story in about a sentence, then it's a no-go. Yeah, I mean, funding a game made by the Galaxy Brain director of Killer7 and then giving him reductive constraints like that does seem like a very EA thing to do. So it's unsurprising that something feels a little bit insincere about Shadows of the Damned. It's worth noting that Kadokawa Games, the Japanese publisher for Lollipop Chainsaw and Killer is Dead, were the ones who pushed for the Gigolo missions to appeal more to the Japanese market. I'm not even a detractor of those, but if it wasn't what the actual devs wanted to do, then of course I'm disappointed there wasn't more pushback so they could create exactly what they wanted. Apparently, with Killer is Dead and Lollipop back to back, Suda was worried that Grasshopper would suddenly be seen as this erotic company. It's interesting that this image of him as a sexy provocateur was perhaps pushed on him more than he actually wanted it to be. Going back to the subject of character designs, it's interesting that in this book, Suda says for No More Heroes 2, they came up with the character designs before what would happen in the game, unlike with the first title, and that as a result he thought the story was more thin compared to the original. Which explains a lot why a lot of the bosses probably lack any sort of personality compared to the breadth of character on display with the bosses in the first No More Heroes. There's a fun little anecdote in this book about how when working on Killer7, Shinji Mikami was pushing Suda to design the entire game scenario by himself. But Suda kept trying to pawn bits of it off on other staff members until Mikami caught him. I don't know if this had anything to do with it, but pushing Suda to do this did result in absolutely the company's most inspired work. And I wish more Grasshopper Suda games would take that approach and focus on a singular original vision and stop getting sidetracked as much. Because there doesn't seem to be one singular reason why newer Suda games come out less interesting than they used to. Looks like a lot of factors that just add up. But if anything could perhaps put things back on track, it would be making some games with less voices from all over the world chiming in to dilute the vision. With Killer7, Suda wanted to create a whole new gameplay style from scratch, and that is not the impression I get with many Grasshopper games since. Because despite the fact that I still respect Suda and this company a lot for trying to put a fun, colorful spin on everything they make, is that really enough in this day and age? We're not living in the gloomy 7th gen now where every other game is a grey shooter. Now, some of the biggest games are colourful action titles with loads of personality and inventive characters. Does it make you all that cool and edgy to create an action game and put some crass humour and a kooky cast and protagonist in there? A game like No More Heroes just seems to have way more to say than a lollipop chainsaw, but whether it be deep subtext or super basic stuff like polish, I can't help but feel there's been a downgrade. Killer7 and No More Heroes had tiny details like stylized transitions out of cutscenes. But now it's just like, eh, slap a fade out on that, who cares? Killer7 and No More Heroes weren't just cool because they were quote-unquote weird, they were cool because they played with conventions. 
They created new gameplay rhythms that at the time had me thinking that this was going to be the next Trailblazer studio that would hit it out of the park with something truly amazing one day. And while I don't want to dunk on anyone and invalidate their feelings if they really enjoyed some of the games I've criticized in this video, I don't think that day ever came and neither do I think they've been as inspired as they were when they hit the international stage proper back in 2005 with Killer7. But hopefully at some point, they will be again.